Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the Missionaries of Charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Haggerty. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me back. I am, again, so grateful that we've had the opportunity to really explore the great gift of the teachings of St. John of the Cross, especially from your book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation. I think you've helped us to really begin to see the importance and our call to be receptive to the prayer of contemplation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity for these conversations. I think that, as we have discussed numerous times, but it always bears repeating, that contemplation is something that we're all called to. It has a different, potentially a degree or a different aspect or a look for some, given your vocation, but it's still something that is really just a part of the Christian experience, isn't it? Well, that's an interesting question, Chris, because um, perhaps decades ago, that might have been answered differently. But if we uh, not so much treat that question with a logical answer, but the reality is that God wants all of us, those living in the world, as well as those in a cloister or monastery, those who are priests or religious, and those living in the world as in married life or single lives, He wants us to have a true union with him. And there's no way that that happens, except we really are pursuing a deep desire for God in prayer with committed prayer. And if we give ourselves to serious prayer, there is, I'm not going to say a natural, but a supernatural progression that takes place in the life of prayer. And Then your answer is, you know, accurate and correct that, well, your question, you know, as you implied it, we are called to a contemplative depth of prayer to contemplative graces if we are indeed called to holiness. So, and I think this is becoming a more open awareness in among people, not the majority of people, but people are are discovering this great desire for deeper relations with God in prayer, and finding time for silent prayer. When we want something, we find a way to it. And this is true now in the church, I think, in silent prayer, the desire to cultivate something of that in commitment now. You know, I can't help but think of someone that you and I, prior to the start of our recordings of our conversations, you offer a prayer, and at the conclusion, you always invoke St. Joseph, that St. Joseph, pray for us. And here is, I think, someone who can be a real model for the layperson as far as that contemplative aspect. Can you imagine what his prayer must have been like? Because, I mean, he is very busy, very active supporting the family, caring and watching out for their safety and just their everyday needs. And yet, my goodness, what an opportunity for contemplation he must have had. Yeah, it is incredible to think of St. Joseph. It's also I recommend to take him as a great companion and benefactor and intercessor in our lives, which is in a sense a Carmelite thing. Also, it's, it is said in the tradition of the church that it it was St. Teresa of Avila who really 
in a kind of devotional manner, brought him to prominence in the church. And she loved St. Joseph. She named her first Reformed convent after St. Joseph, which was a small convent in Avila itself. She loved St. Joseph. And certainly when you think about living one's life in companionship with the child Jesus, with the growing teenage Jesus, we can assume, and with Mary, um, that is the great goal even in our own lives in prayer, to live a companionship of love with the divine presence and with these saints who are closer to us perhaps than we realize. Again, with St. Joseph, I, I think we can begin to just get glimpses of how it could be done in our own lives as far as that detachment and that receptivity. Again, there's that word to whatever that it is that God is trying to touch in our hearts. Maybe it's to just rest with him, or maybe it's a call to action, but it's just this constant awareness of whatever it is that God might be calling us to in that moment. And I think it's, uh, as long as we're speaking about that, it's good to realize the immediacy in which Joseph responded, just as the immediacy in which Mary responded at the Annunciation. Joseph did not hesitate when he was told, take Mary as your wife into that chaste marriage, and this child is born of the Holy Spirit. And he did not hesitate. That yes, once that gets into our inner spirit, then we have to live from that kind of desire to give to God what he asks to go forward in giving to him. And that's also going to affect the life of prayer in a great way. The depth of prayer has to be something of a yes, imitating, replicating in a certain way, the fiat of Mary at the Annunciation, I am your servant. Let it now be in accord with your word, whatever you may ask. That openness of our will in action and in interior disposition That's what opens us to a door that opens to the heart of God in our lives. And naturally, supernaturally, that affects our life of prayer as we go on in life. Sometimes even in our prayer, and we've discussed this before, we have this desire to understand all things. We want to understand what's happening. We want to understand what we're supposed to do. But sometimes we even have to surrender understanding. That doesn't mean that we're giving up to something that's crazy or I want to be very careful and very reverent how I'm saying this. But for example, even I'm sure for St. Joseph or even the Blessed Virgin Mary, that sometimes you're not always going to understand. I think of the finding in the temple, for example, Our Lady, who was one of the greatest of contemplatives and understood so much, didn't understand in that moment what was occurring. Well, that's so true. And it is striking to realize that Mary and Joseph had to go through their trial of incomprehension of a certain darkness, not knowing what God was doing. And striking that that account of the finding in the temple, it's the fifth joyful mystery, but it's also what we call the third sorrow of the seven sorrows of Mary. Mm -hmm. And that combination is very real, something that will be a joy preceded by a terrible anxiety they went through to the point where Mary says in the gospel account, why did you treat us like this? Joseph and Mary sharing that. You know, it reminds us in, in the things that God does in our lives that the words of Jesus, I always find these good to return to when he was going to wash the feet of Peter and Peter question him, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus saying, you do not know now what I am doing. Later, you will understand. And some of that understanding may be in the next life. And some of it may not be a full comprehension why God does what he does. But it does happen for people who give themselves in greater surrender to God, that things do make sense in time that trials, sufferings do produce their fruit in time when there is great surrender. 
and the life of prayer itself. We may not know what he is doing in the moment, but in time, we begin to see what to perceive in a certain way what he is drawing from the soul in greater love for him, a greater surrender and the letting go of ourself into the hands of God. These things do take place. I mean, life is a progressive movement. And this was true for Mary and Joseph. It was true in Jesus' own earthly existence. It moves over time to greater realities in time. It strikes me that in our previous conversations up to this point, we had been talking about those early signs of contemplation and how they can be made manifest within the context of those moments of prayer that we may have set aside for meditation and just sitting and trying to, with our effort, entering into prayer. But as we're speaking now, I think this reflects on the fruitfulness of the overall nature of contemplation that, yes, those are the beginnings, but a life as it's steeped in this type of openness, this receptivity to that contemplation, it begins to permeate all of your activities, essentially, the movements of your heart to be able to respond if necessary in all those actions, but to the realization that God is there. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense, Chris. And I think maybe to add to that, the life of prayer, as well as the entire life of a human person, if we are growing with God, becomes less perhaps activities. Now, when we begin praying, and even now, I have activities as I pray, if I'm praying the divine office. Activity maybe is not the right word for the offering of the Mass, but there is a manner of, in a sacred way, as much as possible, to pray through a ritual formula of prayer when we offer Mass as a priest. And praying the Rosary is a certain activity in doing that prayer. But when we are growing with God, and if contemplative graces begin to infuse themselves by God's gratuitous, great acts of of generosity, if that begins to happen, prayer is less activity than a growing disposition within the interior life, that we have orientations that begin to become more alive, a disposition of turning toward him and his presence becomes, in a sense, the more dominant reality of prayer. We're leaning in the direction receptively toward him. It's almost as though we really are in his presence in a more immediate, direct way once the threshold of contemplative grace begins in a life. So if we were in the presence of well, of Mother Teresa, for instance, when she was living, or if we had a meeting, you know, some encounter with John Paul, we would have our eyes wide open, our ears wide open. We would be leaning, perhaps even almost physically, in the direction of that person. But we would be leaning with heart and spirit toward them. And something like that is going to happen in prayer, where we're not so much doing some active activity as we pray and speaking words that are directed by ourselves, but we're leaning in this receptive way in inclination toward God. So the dispositions of the person are undergoing change, and that really means the interior life is undergoing a kind of altered dimension within. We'll return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions, which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. 
We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. You're starting to sound very much like St. Paul, where he encourages us to pray 24-7. It becomes just a part of everything that we are and everything that we're doing. And it doesn't seem attainable when you read those particular passages of his, how can I pray all the time? And yet, is this what he's alluding to, perhaps? That's a good question, because when we read in in St. Paul saying, you know, pray at all hours or all, all the time, that you could pray ceaselessly is the word that he uses. St. Augustine was struck by that phrase, and he will answer it by saying, you pray with your desire. If your desires are ceaseless, then your prayer is ceaseless. If you have a longing for God, a longing to please him, a living out of life in his presence in a certain manner, then in one way we are praying all the time. I remember reading this some years ago, and I ordinarily mention it on retreats with the Missionaries of Charity, that I remember reading about a French Trappist who in his earlier days, he became a medical doctor in France, and he had lost his faith in his early years and perhaps studying, you know, sometimes people when they're studying science, very, and very talented in intellect, he gave up his faith and lost his faith. And then he recovered his faith in his 40s. And with that newfound conversion, full of zeal, he joined the Trappist monastery in France. And by his own account, he said, I was a little bit disappointed with the Trappist life. They were very, very good men, holy men, hardworking men. But he did not find the monastic life in the, in the monastery that contemplative. They were good, ascetical, hardworking, virtuous men, very good. But prayer, well, we went through the daily prayer that a, a, mon- a monastic life would live. And then by his own account, about 25 years of living Trappist monastic life, he was elected the abbot. So now he's about 70 years old. And he said in his first conference, he told his monks, I'm putting you now under obedience. This is not simply a recommendation, but under obedience. When you are in the fields doing the work, you are to stop seven times a day. And for one minute, seven times a day out in the fields, you are to stop each one alone. No bell will ring, but you are to stop each one. And for one minute, offer your life to God. Make a great surrender in love to God for one minute. Close your eyes, look at the sky or look at the ground, but do that for one minute. And then his final comment on this was, 
One year later, he had a monastery full of contemplative, real contemplative monks. Perhaps not 100%, but the, the reality of that story strikes me a lot, that if we can pause in a day, and many people do that. Some people stop to pray the Chaplet of Mercy, where they pray three Hail Marys, you know, in a, a few times a day. But that pausing in some manner, even a minute, we could do that. How many times people stop to look at their the smartphone or the iPhone? And that pausing before God does feed a disposition of wanting and longing for God. We don't see him. That presence then is, is touched in some manner. And surely God is pleased by that. It is something I think when people hear of St. John of the Cross, they also connect that idea of a darkness, that there is something that is so deep and so understandable that they almost, they're, can I use the word repelled? They just, they don't even want to even consider what he might be teaching. And it's unfortunate because how he talks about the inner life and some of the challenges that we have discussed, that there isn't necessarily something to run from. And I think that is a part of that clarity that you offer so beautifully in St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, because you do talk about the darkness that can begin to enter into this experience when one is being very open, very receptive to what the Holy Spirit might be doing in that person's life. Well, John of the Cross is famous for the expression, which actually he didn't use precisely, but of the dark night of the soul, which perhaps, you know, in time we might talk about. That's a, an advanced state of trial that some souls have undergone. But John of the Cross does make much of the metaphor of darkness, the effect on the human person of supernatural graces advancing them into closer, you know, deeper relations with God. And part of that darkness is the effect of the infinite transcendence of God to our experience. It's one thing to say that God is love, as St. John will say in his letters in the Bible, in the New Testament. It's another thing to realize what is really being said there. It's one thing to read in the gospel and, yes, nod our heads in affirmation when Jesus says, whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. Or when Philip asked him that question, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Philip, have I been with you so long, and still you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And we can affirm, yes, he's speaking there about the oneness of himself with the Father, the reality of the Trinity. But it's another thing to realize in truth that we can't comprehend, we can't put our minds around and hold in some satisfying sense of knowledge, the great mystery of love that is being expressed there. And what John of the Cross is going to insist on is that in the life of prayer itself, there is an experience as faith deepens, that's going to pervade the intellect in a certain manner. It's like if you are soaking a sponge with water, that affects the sponge. It was dry before, and now it's soaked with water. Well, I'm not sure it's the best metaphor for it, but if faith begins to soak the intellect more, the experience in prayer is a more overwhelming sense of the reality of God, that it stretches the mind beyond what it's capable of. So there's an incapacity for our human experience of intellect to understand the true reality of God who is infinite love. And this begins to enter into the life of prayer more. So it's a darkness, a blinding of the mind, a blinding of our experience of God that is not 
at first glance, that's not a pleasant thing to be blinded. But the reality is, as John of the Cross will say, we walk securely forward toward God. We are going to enter more deeply into relations of love with him as we accept and surrender ourselves to that aspect of, of prayer that we will be in some manner in relations with a God who is incomprehensible and yet very personally present, very much near and drawing us in a, in a longing for him. As you were speaking, I couldn't help but think in my own very rather simplistic way, it conjured up in my own mind what it's like when I, I wake up. Sometimes my husband gets up earlier than I do And I have to bolt up to go somewhere, but it's still dark out, but he's flipped on a light and it hurts my eyes. And I'm just stumbling around a little bit and I'm trying to get to that point where the light's been turned on and it hurts. But once your eyes adjust to it, now I can see. And then it's so much easier. It's like I can can maneuver more freely. But in that initial, when the light comes on in that dark room, it does, it's kind of painful and you, and you kind of like, whoa. What was that? Is is that overly simplistic maybe, but maybe a possible little glimpse of what that might be like? Yeah, except, Chris, that it may be that as we go on in a life with God, it's not as though things clear up and the lights begin to shine now in a way that's more comfortable, mm-hmm. that we uh, adjust ourselves and accustom ourselves to that light after the initial discomfort. The reality of God may become more of a mystery. The mystery is of a very personal being of God. And if we are praying in front of the Eucharist, of a real personal presence. And yet beyond our understanding, beyond our ability to enclose in a a satisfying, narrow understanding, John of the Cross is saying, in one sense, to be blind in that manner before the one we love is no problem. That blindness is not a sense of his absence. It's simply a reality of not being able to see. And in fact, that's part of our common life with God. We do not see him in the Eucharist. And yet what looks like a piece of bread, a fragile host, There is no bread, you know, when we, after the consecration of bread into the body of Christ, there is no wine after that consecration of wine into his blood. We live with this sense of a blinding mystery, you know, in our usual life as Catholics. And this takes place also perhaps in the interior life, that his personal presence is very real and of great depth but we don't have a, an open door to understanding or to getting more comprehensive knowledge of God. We remain blind. And John of the Cross has a great phrase in the spiritual canticle in his first stanza commentary, faith and love are like a blind man's guides. They will lead you down a path unknown to you to the place where God is hidden. It's, it's a great phrase when we think about that. We are a blind man walking forward in our spiritual life, but faith and love are the two companions, like at each elbow, leading us down a path unknown to us to the place where God is hidden. We're always being taken by God if we surrender ourselves to the, we're entering into this greater mystery of God where he remains hidden and yet encounters us with his personal presence. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission 
which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty.